one was convex now let's make it more interesting and uh, turn on convex and the reason why people these days uh, look a lot about uh, you know look into uh, non-convex problems a lot is as you can imagine is because this new line of research that everyone is doing uh, deep learning and it seems like whatever you used to do before you just have completely ignored and now everyone's doing deep learning so non-convex is important so let's talk about non-convex but still no, second order right <laughs> and I said non-second order because I was that non was supposed to be here I remember what happened so the non was supposed to be here and then I looked at this slide this morning and I said oh no 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 the second part is non-convex and I put a non in here no, but I didn't <laughs> 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 All right. okay it's but it's still off to yes. <laughs> that's true <laughs> that's true all right so non-convex um, as you can imagine, non-convex is hard. Uh, reason being, you it just you're not dealing with only one one point of interest. You have a lot more to deal with. Uh, some of them are interesting. Some of them are the ones that you want to avoid. And this includes like saddle points, local maxima, local minima, and so on and so forth. So escaping these things, trying to avoid them, and try to get to them, it's much harder. It's not uh, as clear as uh, convex problems anymore. In fact. Um, it's not even enough to satisfy the first order necessary condition because all stationary points, including global uh, maximal and the saddle points, satisfy those. So you really don't know where you are. I mean, if you have a point degree and a zero, you haven't said much in the convex, non-convex setting. You need what's uh, a little bit more, and that's what's known as the second order condition, where you want where you at your Hessian to be positive semi-definite. What does that mean? Um, um, or that. So this is a necessary condition, meaning that if you are at a local minimum, then you necessarily have these conditions, meaning that your, uh, your Hessian is positive semi-definite, i.e. there is no direction of descent. There are flat regions, but there is no direction that pointing down, downwards. You pretty much, that's it. Now, um, the, su the sufficient condition is that this Hessian is positive definite, meaning that every direction actually is pointing, pointing up. There is no flat direction. Because you can show that if you have a flat direction, you still might not be at a, uh, at a uh, what do you call it, a, a local minimum. And that's why it's a necessary condition. But regardless, you have, you have to deal with more of, uh, satisfy more than just gradient being small. And in fact, uh, a whole lot of complexity issues arise in non-convex problems. Just checking some of these things or, you know, got some kinds of a complexity issues with them, which are, makes everything hard. And there is this saying, I don't know who said it, but I know someone said it, that uh, say all convex problems are the same, uh, while every non-convex problem is different. And that's very true, right? You can have every convex problem, you can pretty much fit it in a bowl, but non-convex problem, who knows how they look like. Okay, so too much to ask for an exact optimality. You can never get it. So what we settle in, settle with, is the what's known as the approximate optimality or epsilon optimality, which you want to be a point where the gradient is small. That's not too crazy, but uh, we also want the uh, minimum eigenvalue of the Hessian. It's okay if it's negative, but it shouldn't be too negative. Meaning that I'm okay if I, I'm at a region where there is still a direction that's going down, but as long as that direction is not too crazy steep, I call it a good point. And that's what's known as the uh, approximate optimality. So ideally, the algorithms that you design in non-convex settings you want them to satisfy these conditions. So you prescribe what your tolerance for epsilon g and h would be, and uh, you end up getting, you want to have an algorithm that guarantees you that you end up giving that point if you wait long enough. All right, so uh, I'm gonna, as I said, I divided the non-convex methods into uh, two parts. One is the two classes, one line search based methods and trust region. And these two, are techniques to globalize optimization algorithms because in non-convex it's sort of e it's convex sorry in convex it's sort of easy you can just you know a simple type of uh, globalization most often line search for example simple line search works and you end up getting descent but uh, in non-convex it's not as 
that's easy anymore. You need to come up with, with you know, different strategies to make your method globalized, meaning to converge from any, any point. Uh, one of those classes is line search based methods still, and uh, they involve a lot of um, um, different methods. This is not, shouldn't be here. Uh, I, I'm not gonna talk about it, I obviously didn't have time. So I'm only talking about BFGS, Gauss, Newton, and Natural Gradient, all right? So let me talk, start with the BFGS. Most people have heard BFGS. It's actually one of the very few second order algorithms that uh, is being used quite a bit in machine learning. And, but let me with, start with another disclaimer and a sad point. And even though I put BFGS in non-convex setting, and even though BFGS is used on almost any non-convex problem, you can throw at it, it's pretty good. But you can show that there are non-convex problems where BFGS actually ends up failing regardless of what you do in terms of the line search. Whether you do exact line search or whether you do inexact line search, Wolfie, if you haven't heard about that, I'll talk about it in a few slides. But whatever you do, doesn't matter. You end up circling around points that you don't want. But the good point is that one is yet to see BFGS not working in any reasonable problem that we come across with on uh, any, any scientific domain. These are very sort of like a cooked up problems, but these are any, it almost always works on any problem that you, you, uh, you encounter in practice. And as a result, uh, I put it in the non-convex uh, section, even though the guarantees are mostly for convex problems, but in practice it works for non-convex, so I would like to give it the respect it deserves and needs to be classified as a non-convex method. All right, so if you haven't seen BFGS before, let me quickly run through what the quasi-Newton methods are. And let's start with Newton method, they're quasi-Newton methods, so it must have something to do with Newton. So let's review Newton, but in the context of root finding, right? Suppose I have a nonlinear function from R to R, and my goal is to find the root of R. So I want to find a point in R such that this is zero. We just saw an example of it in the, in the last session, and that is how I'm going to do this. Well, let me just write this, which is zero, and form the uh, Taylor expansion of them. I'm supposing everything is smooth. So I, I, put the I, I write the Taylor expansion around any given iterate, let's say, xk. This is equality still, because this is exact Taylor expansion with the remainder. All right, now I drop this remainder. So this equality is no longer holding, but I'd like to find out what I put in here such that this equality still remains. And the, put, the point that I put in here ends up being my next iterate. And if I rearrange stuff, I end up getting what's very famous, famous Newton iterations for root finding, right? R divided by its derivative. Well, what if you don't have access to the, uh, to the derivative? What if it's hard to get it, or for some reason you don't have access to it? Then the next step is what people call a secant method, which is the setup is exactly the same as before. However, you don't have r prime, so you end up approximating r prime by finite difference. By finite difference, given the iterate you are at right now and the iterate you were last iteration. And you approximate the R rot with this finite difference, you plug that into the same iteration I had before, and you end up getting what's known as a secant equation. And if you can, run, if you, you can show that the convergence rate to this is actually scales with the, what's known as a golden ratio, so it's, it's a superlinear convergence with the rate of golden ratio, and uh, in contrast of the Newton, which if I had Newton instead of this golden ratio, I would have put, had two. So I lost a little bit in terms of the rate of convergence by again, because I don't have to deal with derivatives anymore. And the quasi-Newton methods are exact same idea. They'd like to take this idea of a secant method into higher dimensions. That's the basic idea of a quasi-Newton method. <clears throat> Let's see how they achieve that. Okay, so I have a fun, let me talk this uh, quasi-Newton methods because they're used for the optimization. In optimization, the root finding problem is the root of the gradient. Suppose that's all we care about. Yes, sorry. Is this related to the BB rule? Um, maybe, actually. It's a good, it's a good thing. Maybe, because that's also, uh, I don't remember. But it's very close. You're right, because it's like, a, you know, two. 
No, 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 because the other one doesn't involve XK. I think it's only, it computes the residual with the, using the iterate one before current. I don't think it has any information, it doesn't use any information from the current iterate in computing the step size. But it, there could be some connections. I don't remember BB. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so for the, for the optimization, the nonlinear function we would like to find the root of is the derivative, right? So it's the gradient. Suppose that's a good thing to do. Um, so instead of uh, talking about r, I'm talking about f prime, derivative of some function I want to minimize. And instead of the r prime, I'll talk about f, f double prime. So f double prime uh, approximated with the secant. I'll plug it. So I want to see if I just rearrange stuff, I end up getting this approximate equality. So that means that, um, yeah, this is not going to be an equality for the sake that I'm approximating second derivative with the finite difference. But it still is, is, is an, it's an approximation. In a higher dimension, let's see what happens. Again, Taylor expansion, what else? Right, That's the basic building block of optimization in a lot of ways. Do the Taylor expansion or the uh, mean value theorem, if you, will, if you will, the vector value version of it. and uh, you know, I can write everything as in this compact form. Still, everything is equality. Suppose my p is very small. So I'm, I'm talking now. I'm higher dimensions. So x is a vector. And that's why I have a gradient. So suppose p is very small. So I can ignore this term. And I plug p x. I let me call x to be x k and p to be where I came from to get to x k. Right? The difference between the previous iterate and the current iterate. Plug in back in here, remove that, turn this equality into approximation. I end up getting something that's very similar to this, but with higher dimensions. So nothing magical, right? I end up getting this approximation. The idea of a quasi newt method is this. Why do, what do I put in here to turn this inequality into an equality? How could I replace this Hessian by what approximation such that I turn this inequality to equality. And the difference is, and this, this equality actually is famously in quasi-Newton literature is known as secant condition for obvious reason because it's motivated by secant, uh, secant algorithm. This is one interpretation of the quasi-Newton stuff. And I'm going to talk about how we choose H. So, yes. Is it H a matrix and these are vectors? Correct. But H is the thing you're trying to Correct. Update? So there is more than you, okay. there is over constraint, under constraint. Correct. I'll talk about it. Um, another interpretation of the quasi-Newton or, or this sort of a uh, secant condition, one is this one. There is another interpretation actually is very interesting. It's very, actually ingenious. Suppose you have your quadratic. Suppose someone gives you the H and you solve this problem with the interior point method, say, and you end up getting some Y and you step generate the step size, you get XK plus one. All right? So you have an HK at the current iteration. Use that. Use the next up. Get the next update XK plus one. The question is this: Can I update my HK such that the next quadratic approximation? How can I update XK such that the next, essentially a good or a better quadratic approximation for the next iteration? So how can I accept HK such that this quadratic approximation is going to be a good one using HK? and xk plus 1. The basic idea of how to do this initially was done, was suggested by Davidon. I've got a little bit of trivia, I'll tell you about this guy. And uh, what he thought, he said, you know, it's a quadratic. It needs to interpolate points. All right, so what are the reasonable points that I want this quadratic to interpolate? One is that at the current path, if p is 0, essentially this is a quadratic along, uh, around the next iterate, right? If I'm not going anywhere, I want the gradient of this quadratic to match the gradient of the true function. Well, trivially does. I take the gradient of this, set p to go 0, I end up getting that. So it's trivial. The next thing he said, he said that's fine about the current point, but how about the point that I came from? If I kept the gradient of this function and go back where I started, I want that also to match the gradient at the point that I started. 
And if you write this out, you end up getting secant equation. So secant equation can motivate it both ways. This was the way that Davidon thought about. Now let me tell you a little bit about Davidon. So he was in the 1950s, I think, he was working in Argonne National Lab. And uh, back then computers were horrible, right? You, you just crack, crashed all the time, they were unstable, power outages, and so on and so forth. And uh, guess what? He had a problem, probably 10 by 10 at the time, or 5 by 5. And uh, he was running coordinate descent, right? That's all he could do at the time. Do <laughs> coordinate descent. He couldn't solve the problem because after like, he had to take like 10 hours to finish and the computer always crashed. So he was frustrated, you know, I can't, I want something faster because I can't wait that many hours because the computer is just going to crash again and I have to do this all over again. And he comes up with this idea of a quasi-Newton and that's where the revolution starts. But the funny thing about this is that the idea that he came up with in 1950s didn't get published, remained unpublished for almost 30 years. And it got published 30 years later. This, this revolution, essentially, the BFGS or, quadrat or the quasi-Newton revolution, the paper that gave rise to it wasn't, was unpublished for 30 years until the Siam Journal of Optimization started in the early 90s. And the very first, the very first issue, they actually published the paper because they realized how, how important it was. But if you search his name up on the Wikipedia, that's not what he's known for, actually. That's not the reason why it's on Wikipedia. It's because this guy actually broke into an FBI office, and they stole some documents because he was a peace activist. And uh, he gave, you know, the stuff that he did uh, revealed some of the secrets that the government was doing, and so on and so forth. But they were so smart, as you can imagine, that they evaded any kind of prosecution, and the FBI couldn't pin them down with anything. So it's actually quite an interesting character, in my opinion. Anyways, uh, a little bit of trivia. Witch hunt. What's, sorry? Witch hunt. Witch hunt, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so let's go back to the secant equation. Just Dustin, uh, Dustin pointed out exactly that, well, I have a sort of a vector equality with an unknown matrix, so I have D equations and D squared unknowns. There's more degrees of freedom that I can fail, so what should I do? The differences between quasi-Newton methods boil down to the constraints that you put in here for H to satisfy in order to fill up the differences between D and D squared. That essentially you can call the different quasi-Newton methods in the differences between how they fill this gap, right? I'm only going to talk about the BFGS Every one of these quasi-Newton methods behaves differently, but I'm only going to focus on BFGS because it's the most successful one. And in fact, recently I heard it won the Test of Time Award because it's, you know, it's such a wonderful algorithm. All right, so um, in the, I'm, I'm going to use the notation that you see throughout the literature of the quasi-Newton uh, method, where the difference between the iterates are denoted by S, the difference between gradients are denoted by Y. Don't ask me what and why this was 1950s and 60s, I guess people really didn't care much about the uh, readability and those sort of things. So S and Y. But that's a legacy we got to deal with. All right. For BFGS, instead of updating H, BFGS actually wants... Pre okay. In order to find an H that satisfies the secant equation, BFGS says, you know what, let me find its inverse such that so inverse of H, B, such that, you know, if I, okay, let me go back here. If I take the inverse of this and put it on this side, it will be the inverse of H satisfying the secant equation the other way around. And BFGS says, I would like to do it that way. Don't ask me why again. It's, it's a good idea. Um, what, what, what they do? They say, if I'm given a B that satisfies the secant equation, I have many other bees, uh, sorry, I have so many bees that can satisfy the, uh, the, the, ne the next uh, secant equation, right? Given an old bee, I would like to find a new bee, and I have so many ways of doing that. Among all these ways, I'd like to pick the only matrix that is not only closest to my previous quasi-Newton update, not only is symmetric, but also it satisfies the secant equation. Now, there is this norm that BFGS particularly chooses by choosing a particular W that's nice and gives rise to this elegant equation for updating B, 
and uniquely you can go from B to BK plus 1. Through this sort of a constraint optimization, you can fill all the remaining degrees of freedom and you get to BK plus 1. Now, interesting about this thing is that there is no notion of positive definiteness. Remember, po we want our matrix to be positive definite because if we get directions from positive definite matrix, we can guarantee direction of descent. But there is no guarantee here that we end up getting a B that's positive definite. How can we enforce this? In a very elegant way. And the idea is, if your B is already positive definite, all I need to ensure for BK plus 1 to be positive definite is for this term over here to be positive. And this is called a curvature condition. If I can satisfy the curvature condition, meaning that this product is positive, remember what Y was, the differences between gradient, S was the difference between the iterates. If I can satisfy that, I end up getting, I can guarantee that starting from any positive definite, I remain positive definite. Now, for convex struggling, co strictly convex problems, you don't have to worry about it. This is the definition of a strictly convex, actually, problem, that this is always going to be positive. But for, non for the non-convex problems, you can ensure that by doing a particular type of line search known as the Armico plus the Wolfie. Armico guarantees the descent, enough descent. That was exactly the same equation I had in the previous session. But the Wolfie is new one, and that's the one that ensures this. And under a strong convexity, as I said, the theory is limited to strong convexity or some heavy-duty assumptions on the iterates. You can show that this method converges with superlinear rate of convergence, the same way as the original secant. Uh, and this is a full BFGS. Uh, you might wonder, hey, I'm dealing with matrices and I'm updating them by adding something to my previous matrix, so the storage is crazy, right? If D is large. I'm, think, I'm talking about the D squared, so that's not a good idea. And people thought about it and said, instead of doing a BFGS, I'm going to do what's, or quasi-Newton, I'm, I'm going to do what's known as a limited memory quasi-Newton, in particular, limited memory BFGS, which are low storage methods. And uh, how they work is that instead of storing the matrix B and keep updating it that way, they only store a, a history of the, of the vectors S and Y, right? We up, compute that at every iteration for the update anyways, so you might as well keep a history of them, not all the way from the, starting the uh, start of the algorithm, just to some back history point of size M, say. And now, if you look at the, the, the update of B, by the way, this, we are inverting, we are updating the inverse of H, so we can easily apply it in the optimization by just multiplying this by vector. There is no matrix inversion involved, there is no linear system involved, right? Because I'm updating H inverse. Using Sherman Morrison type formula, you can actually translate that also to be an update for H as well, but why would you want to do that when you can update B and just apply B to a vector and you're done? Um, but as you can see, uh, the update of um, BK plus 1 will depend on SK, YK, and BK. As you can imagine, BK itself will depend on BK minus 1, SK minus 1, YK minus 1, so it's a recursive uh, type iteration. So all I need to do, I just need to say BK implicitly is defined as BK minus 1, YK minus 1, SK minus 1. BK minus 1, again, <coughs> is implicitly defined as these two all the way to BK minus M. So as a result, I can pretty much say BK itself is implicitly defined of all these vectors. I'm not going to form these. When I need them, I just compute them in a, in a smart way through a, what's known as a two-loop recursion. I just, if I unwind this recursion all the way back to M and rearrange it nicely, you see that all you need is just vector products. And uh, the initial, their initial B, you can scale it to be, uh, to initialize it to be some scalar of identity. It's actually very important what you put in here. There are many heuristic rules, uh, and there are some that backed by some theory, but it's very, it makes it, breaks BFGS what you put in here. All right, and it's got a linear rate of convergence. So you lose the superlinearity, but you still have a linear convergence. So you yeah. approximate B by only looking at so much history? Correct. That's what's known as a limited memory, right? Okay, so uh, remember the curvature condition. Did, did I start at 11? Is that when the session started? Okay. okay. 
So the, the curve, remember the curvature condition, right? So the difference between the gradient, there's a parenthesis missing here, and the xk difference between the iterates. I need it to be strictly positive to maintain positive definition of the update, right? As I said, if I have a strictly convex problem, I don't have to worry about it, because that's a definition. It comes out as a definition of the convex problem. It's just a, um, maybe, I don't know if it's a def, you can call it a definition, but it's definitely an implication of being strictly convex. If you're strictly convex, your gradient is what's known as a monotone, and as a result, maybe it is equivalent, but it's definitely the implication of a strictly convexity that the gradient is monotone, so you always get this. So you don't have to worry about, about the satisfying this requirement. But in non-convex case, as I mentioned, in addition to our Michael line search, you also need to do what's known as a Wolfy condition. Now, what is a Wolfy condition? It tries to mimic this curvature condition in a smart way by saying that, I have direction P, I'd like to go along that P long enough such that the inner product between the P and my gradient at the next iteration is some constant fraction larger than the, than the, the, the same product at the current point. <coughs> now it's a little bit, you know, maybe unintuitive why this is a good idea. There are pictures in classical textbooks you can look at why they say this is not a bad idea or this is a, essentially actually an intu intuitive way of doing this, but it's easy to show that this condition satisfied that. Well, we know that this is always a descent direction, right? So it's a negative number. So this whole thing has to be bigger than, uh, strictly bigger than this thing without the beta, right? So beta is smaller than one. So I'll make this smaller by removing beta, rearrange stuff, bring everybody to one side, uh, take the difference of this f, multiply it by alpha, put the definition of p and, and alpha p, and I end up getting exactly that. So it guarantees these, this curvature condition. But the problem now is, this is all deterministic. Now the problem starts when you're trying to add stochasticity into the business. When you gradient are noisy, then what are you gonna do? Because in that case, suppose I have a noisy estimate of a gradient here, and a noisy estimate of the gradient here. I'm taking a difference of two noisy things. How can I ensure that the curvature condition is satisfied? That's a big, big open, in fact, maybe not an open problem, but that's a, that's a big problem to deal with when we are taking BFGS into a stochastic regime. And I'm gonna talk about a few of those issues. So an example of the approach that people do, they say, you know, I have two steps. I have the, um, the, the, the computing the gradient estimate by subsampling, say, and the other one is to get the, uh, the difference of these two to compute y. I might be able to decouple these two, even though on the surface they're pretty much uh, related, but I might be able to decouple them in a, in a actually a clever way. They say, it, my s was the difference between iterates, let me turn it into be the difference between the average of the last few iterates. L could be one, mind you. There is nothing in the theory that says L should be bigger than one. But in a general way, maybe practically that makes better sense. Um, and why, remember it was the difference between the no and, uh, gradients. Well, the gradients are noisy. So I have two options. Either I can, suppose I'm doing subsampling. Either I can take the subsample, same subsample and comp compute the differences of the gradient. That's at least going to give me something that's the same function at the end of the day. But suppose even that is not possible, then what, can, what I can do, I can approximate this difference by Hessian times a vector, right? The directional derivative of the, uh, of the gradient along a vector is actually the product of the Hessian times that vector. And this is essentially approximating that, that statement right there that the directional derivative along this difference is the Hessian times that difference. And uh, they show that if we use this SK and YK to update our quasi-Newton update, and we can do it every L iterations, again, it doesn't have to be bigger than, uh, bigger than one, it could be one, so update at every iteration. They show that this will ensure that my positive, my Hessian is actually remains positive definite. Right, so they satisfy now the problem of uh, maintaining a positive definiteness. They satisfy through some, some smart way of doing these things. And finally, using a constant step size and yet, sorry, not, not constant, diminishing step size. So the noise here is the gradient, right? It's like an, 
think of it as a mini batch type gradient with curvature applied to using the quasi-Newton matrices. With some diminishing step size, you end up getting sublinear rate, which is similar to the sublinear rate you get as uh, SGD. So you might wonder, hey, why do I go through all these problems to get the sublinear rate that's uh, like SGD? I will get back to this and I'll definitely make sure I get back to this point later because I have few stuff to talk about, about the, these, these sort of concerns. <clears throat> All right, so let me actually push forward. Uh, I've put these things for you, archival purposes. You can, you can look. Uh, Fred? Yes. Uh, um, so can I ask a question just sure. to see if I'm sure. understanding? So sure. you have this, the, 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 this connection based on Davidson um, that said that for the two steps, you're basically fitting the Hessian so it goes through the last couple points. Sure. Is the right way to interpret this that it's kind of because we're keeping more points around, you're fitting the Hessian to go through the last, is it M points or last K? Well, no, so the, so no, the, the true Hesh, the, the idea of finding the true uh, quasi-Newton update was by forming this quadratic. Now, when you relax this by only keeping only a certain number of vectors, you're not fitting any points anymore, right? You're just perturbing this quadratic to be something that's only maybe at one point is interpolating the original quadratic and the rest of the points are not going to be. But hopefully it's not too far off. Um, so it is, it, it's not exact fit necessarily, but no. find, it's roughly trying to fit that. Correct. And that's, Correct. that's kind of what's going on. Correct. Right. Correct. Thank you. And then, uh, okay, so let me push forward. And so this idea of that paper by using a Hessian times a vector, which is actually a pretty neat idea, a very clever idea. Uh, some, a couple years after that, they combined the ideas of that paper plus this variance reduction stuff that took machine learning by storm a few years ago and still is a very powerful, tools, powerful tool to use. And they say, well, okay, so my gradient is noisy. Let me reduce the noise by doing this variance reduction technique. What is a variance reduction technique? is that call, we call the SVRG original paper stochastic variance reduced gradient descent and they say in the gradient descent I have an outer loop right that I iterate now I would like to correct from my, so for SGD you have one loop you iterate here now I turn it into two loops where in the, in, the, in the inner loop I try to correct sorry in the outer loop I try to correct for what happens in the inner loop and what does that mean is that suppose S is my inner loop and K is my outer loop, which actually the original optimization uh, iterations. Instead of only looking at, say I'm doing SGD with one sample, instead of only looking at the gradient at one sample at the current iterate, I look at the difference of that and this two sum, which is the gradient at that exact sample but evaluate it at a point, a few points before that, plus the full gradient at a few point before that. So this middle function here shares the index j with this one and the argument with that one. This, you can sh easily see that in expectation, this is exactly the same as the full gradient evaluated at this point. Sorry, so y yes, because this, if this is an unbiased estimator of that one, this will cancel that one. This will be the full gradient as excess. So in expectation is that. But convince yourself that this also reduces the variance of this estimation by this mental practice. Suppose I didn't have this one and I was at the optimal, right? I put X star in here. I don't have to get zero, right? This is, it's true that the, the true function gradient would be zero, but not each individual components. So if I put X star in here, this doesn't have to be zero. But if I put X star in all of these, I actually end up getting zero, right? Because this cancels that one, and this was also by definition zero. So at the optimum, there is no actually variance in this one at all. It's an exact estimate. So you can convince yourself that as you get closer and closer to the optimal solution, the variance of this estimate goes down. Now, what is good thing about it, remember the result that I showed before, they have a diminishing step size. The reason why they have diminishing step size is that they want to reduce this variance of the estimate of the gradient because otherwise you end up bouncing around without converging. Here you don't need to do that, right? Because the variance is, is, is gone down by itself. So as a, by this correction, as a result, you can keep the step size fixed. So this paper used these two ideas, plug them together, and end up getting the linear rate 
recover the linear rate of gradient descent. Yes. How do you have access to the full gradient x k? Yeah, good question. So as I said, this is two loops, right? So at the outer loop, suppose you compute the gradient, keep it in the memory, right? And then you go in the inner loop, you iterate for a whole lot of iterations in the inner loop without doing any real gradient evaluation other than a subsampled version of it. And you keep referring back to the gradient you had in the memory. After a certain number of iterations, you go back up, you update again. Okay, uh, and by the way, the, but, the, but the, there is a caveat, it's not really, the, the caveat is that the convergence rate is actually in terms of the outer iterations. So the, remember that it's not that the iterates in the inner iterations are doing well. In fact, when you go back up, those iterations are descending nicely. All right, and then uh, there is also other techniques that they say, well, you know, it's a subsample. This, uh, this iteration is in this sample set, and the next iteration, I end up getting a different sample set. This difference might be bad. So how about if I get samples that overlap? If they have overlap, I compute this curvature condition on the overlapping index, and, and that's what they do. Yes? In the previous slide, if yeah. the convergence rate was in terms of the other iteration, and each, Correct. Other, each other iteration is as expensive as computing a full gradient? Correct. So what benefit are you getting from doing this stochastic? Well, so the thing is that uh, even though the convergence is on the outer iteration, the hope is that the iterates in the inner iteration will still give you something reasonable because at least at the end of the day, it's like doing a lot of SGD iterations, but with a better <coughs> estimate of the gradient. So even though the guarantee is about the outer, but the practice, the inner would be actually something that you look into. And also you compute the average of the inner ones, so they give you something even better. Think about doing it just the same as SGD, but with an estimate that's, that's a little bit better. Even though the, the real guarantee is about the outside, but the inner iterations are better than SGD. Okay. Uh, and they showed some results about the uh, convergence of BFGS. Let me push on and do the gauss newton Gauss-Newton is a bread and butter of scientific computing, and in particular PD inverse problem people. They use it all the time. And I came to machine, after finishing doing scientific computing, when I started looking into machine learning, I realized that no one actually even knew what Gauss-Newton was, which is very interesting to me. So let me discuss a little bit, because it's got a beautiful connection with, uh, with what people do actually in machine learning, OK? So my problem is that I'm minimizing a, uh, a function. This function is a composition of f over a, of h. h is a vector-valued function going from d to p. And f is a, is a real-valued function taking p to r, and it's convex. So emphasis is that f is convex. h is a vector-valued, so this whole thing doesn't have to be convex. f by itself is convex. All right? So the Jacobian of h, it's a, it's a vector value taking d to p. So the Jacobian at any point would be a p by d matrix. So this is a set of notation. What is the gradient of my composed compose function? Is the Jacobian transpose of h times the gradient of f evaluated at h. All right, so that's not too big deal. What is the Hessian? I do the chain rule, do it again, I end up getting that. This denotes the second derivative of vector valued function h, which in this case would be a tensor, say. What Gas Newton does, Gas Newton says, you know, I'm going to throw away this whole thing altogether. I'm just going to remove this part from the Hessian and only stick with this one. As Michael said yesterday, there's bread here, there's bread here, and real salami, looking red. Right in the middle, this is lettuce. Lettuce, lettuce, and, and salami, right? <laughs> um, they approximate the Hessian with that. And this is called the Gauss-Newton matrix. And once you approximate it with that, you can do Oh, the good thing about this, by the way, is that it's, it is positive semi-definite. Why? Because it's some matrix transpose itself stuck in the middle is a matrix because f was convex. This is also positive definite. This whole thing is going to be positive definite. So I'm throwing away the parts that's going to give me <coughs> negative di direction, curvature. I throw it away, keep the ones that are uh, giving me positive definite. So as a result, if I use this direction, I can guarantee always direction of descent. <clears throat> right? There is another interpretation that uh, it comes as a result of linearization of the inner thing. doesn't matter. Let me talk about the properties of this. As I mentioned, it's positive semi-definite. It's a good approximation is a term that I left out is small. What does that mean? 
either the gradient of the f is small, for example, if f was a quadratic, either the residual inside the, uh, <coughs> inside the quadratic is small, or if the second derivative of h is small, meaning that h is nearly affine. If that's true, then that's going to be a very good approximation. Otherwise, still is a direction is a matrix that's positive semi-definite, incorporates a little bit of a curvature, and it's it's good stuff. And you can also show convergence that uh, you know globally converges in the sense that the gradient goes to zero. You can also show that the actual rate of convergence is linear, and also locally, if I look at it, it will be a linear term plus a quadratic. Linear term depends on the the norm of what I left out. So you can see that if this, what I left out at the optimum, if this is zero, because suppose at the, at the optimum this term is zero, if this is zero, then I actually recover the uh, full rate of the uh, Hessian, full rate of Newton quadratic rate of Newton. Otherwise I get linear. Okay. <clears throat> I was gonna show you some stuff that's not machine learning yet, but I'll leave that and I'm gonna get to a, another uh, interesting algorithm this one is natural gradient. Now, I was doing scientific computing. I had no idea what natural gradient was. So you see the disconnect between the communities. I knew Gauss Newton. I did not, not, I did not know anything about natural gradient. And I came to machine learning. They didn't know Gauss Newton, but they knew a lot about natural gradient. And it turned out that there is a beautiful connection in between the two, which I'll explore in a few slides. A natural gradient is best described by the cross entropy minimization. So if I Consider my optimization problem as being a cross entropy minimization. Natural gradient is, the, is a very natural algorithm to talk about. <clears throat> what does that mean by cross entropy? Suppose I have a density parameterized by x. It's a Gaussian distribution. x corresponds to its mean, whatever, or covariance. So parameterized by certain parameters. <clears throat> the cross entropy minimization of this density with respect to a, a target density x is the minimization of this form. Again, I'm, I am essentially doing the same format as the problem I started with. But here, the f is a log of some, some log likelihood, if you will, uh, with respect to some x. So the unknown is the blue, the known or the fixed one is the red. And I can write it out as the cross-entropy optimization like this. All right. For example, this, this p could be the, uh, the, the empirical measure. What I end up getting is the maximum likelihood over the data points. Right? So this is a general formulation for maximum likelihood that we see all the time. <clears throat> another notation, another thing that comes up is what's known as a Fisher information matrix. By definition, is the expectation of what's known as the score function or the, or the gradient of the log likelihood. The gradient of log likelihood is known as the score function times its transpose is defined to be the Fisher information matrix under some really, really mild regularity assumptions. Pretty much what you need is to make sure that you can take the expectation inside and interchange that with the derivatives. You, you can show that uh, the Fisher information is exactly the same as the negative of expectation of the Hessian of the log likelihood. Okay, these are important. So remember, expectation of the gra gradient log p, gradient log p transpose, or minus the expectation of the Hessian log p. All right, now once I have f, natural gradient says, you know, at every g, I compute f, I compute p, and I keep going. All right, and by definition, f is a positive definite, right? It's vector times its transpose, so it's going to be positive definite, at least positive semi-definite, but for most distributions, actually positive definite. All right, so let me interpret this for you. I mean, this is pretty all of a sudden out of nowhere, right? You get this f, and why, why would that be any good thing to do? Let, let's interpret it. Cross entropy minimization, I want to find an x such that minimizes this and x is fixed. Think of red x as my empirical distribution over the data points. So that's something that I'm given, I can change it. Right? So, so, yes. um, so I just want to be absolutely clear, the sure. two x's are not the same. They're not the same, that's what the colors the are different, yes. Okay. yes. Blue is the unknown that what we are changing, x is the fixed one. Like this black x is blue under men. Oh, yes, <laughs> apologies. This is, yes, okay, this is blue, yes, 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 yes. Thank you, yes, I'll fix this before I post this for sure. Definitely the non-second one at the title, I'll fix that. Okay, so, the, the, yes, blue, that's right. All right. Um, 
let me run Newton method on this. Let me just run one iteration of Newton method. So I'm, I'm at some point x blue. Let I'm forget about the sub superscript k. At some point x blue, what's the Hessian of L? Suppose I'm regular enough that I can take the Hessian inside the expectation. This is the expectation with respect to the fixed x of the Hessian of log likelihood at the one at the blue x that I'm changing. Let me go back here and do the Fisher matrix. It's very similar. It's the expectation of the grid of the Hessian of log p, but with respect to the thing that I'm changing. This is with respect to the thing that I have already and I'm not changing. This is with respect to my iterates. Maybe a little bit abstract. Let me go with the case that we always, almost always see, and that's the uh, empirical risk minimization. Bunch of data points I'm given. Bunch of data points I'm given. I don't know where they come from. They come from some distribution with some parameter x star. I have no idea what it is. But what I end up doing, I end up doing this, forming this uh, finite sum minimization or the empirical risk minimization. Essentially what I'm doing, I'm saying that this red x that was over there, it just assigns 1 over n to every one of these zi's. So my x is one over, gives 1 over n to every one of these. And I don't know what x star is, but I'm given the realization of some of the samples from that. Let me run now Newton iteration on it. Well, that's exactly what we do, right? We take the, this is only a function of x, blue x. I take the derivative grade Hessian with respect to blue x, and I end up getting Hessian, and I do whatever I do with it. But how about if I do the Fisher matrix? I exactly do the same, to get the same thing, but the data that I'm putting in my Fisher information is not the data that I was, get, I was started with. This is not the training data anymore. And this is a very subtle point that believe it or not, so many people say we are doing gradient, natural gradient and they're not doing natural gradient because they're using the training point. You need to generate these points from the new distribution that you're updating. Even nicer than this, let me show you the connection to another method, Gauss-Newton. So we have F composed on H. Suppose H is scalar here, not a vector value, H is scalar. Here, where I have the lo minus log p, my f is minus log of some t, because it's scalar value, a scalar function. h, I call it pxz. In Gauss-Newton, I had the Gauss-Newton matrix is f double prime, gradient, gradient transpose. What is f double prime? Is 1 over p squared. Gradient, gradient transpose is the gradient p, gradient p transpose. Let me group, just rewrite this. It's exactly the same as that. I just split the p's in between the two. But what are these? These are the gradient of log p times the gradient of log p transpose. Very similar to what we saw in the natural gradient. So, now if I'm doing the Gauss-Newton step, I end up forming this gradient gradient transpose using the training data, but the natural gradient step I do gradient gradient transpose, but using the not the training data anymore. Yes. Um, so if the natural gradient, if I'm understanding this correctly, is is estimating something like the Hessian from a sample. Sure. Is that is it is it fair to interpret kind of like a sketched version of this because you're 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 maintaining sketch or a sample or an estimate of what the real Hessian is? Uh, so, I, okay, so if these things, this would be a ap good approximation to that or that would be a good approximation right. to this. If these two distributions are in some sense close, right? But right. there is no reason why to think that this distribution is anywhere near that one, right? So there is no reason to think that this is actually anything to do with this, other than both of them are positive semi-definite, that's all it is. But the, the issue is that people in practice, a lot of machine learners, they say, I'm doing natural gradient, and yet what they're doing is a Gauss-Newton. So they were doing what we were doing in scientific computing, they didn't know what, that they didn't know it. And uh, so in practice, if you're doing natural gradient, recall that at every iteration, you have to generate new samples and compute that, yes? Um, 
Um, so just to help me out, can you sure. review one more time, just, just a couple of words, where the samples are coming from if they're not trying to estimate? Sure. So if you're doing Gauss-Newton, you're given the green, right? You, green is the images in, let's say, CIFAR 10, fixed, right? And this is a log of a Gaussian distribution. Suppose it's like boils down to some simple function parameters by x. So I compute its gradient, and I plug in my data, compare with the labels that I'm given, and I get some number, some matrix, right? Yeah, so that's For, a sample of the data. That's right. right. For the Fisher, I have a new parameter that I updated now, right? I put these parameters into the density. I sample from this new density. These are no longer my CIFAR 10 labels. These are new labels generated from the current iterate. And I form this Fisher information matrix. And that's not what most people do. OK, so it's based on the current estimate of what, say, the classifier or something is. Correct. You Absolutely. Based on that instead. Absolutely. OK, but Absolutely. it seems like they're both kind of sketching at some levels, just there's maybe sketching something. Sure, it's the that. last two days we talk about sketching. Let's call this sketching as well, sure. Okay. But uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I really, honestly, I really don't know uh, how close these things can be uh, in some sense. OK, um, and finally, yes. One more question about this. Sure. So. Yeah, is that OK if I maybe pushed, because I got maybe five more minutes? Push through and then ask any, any question at the end. Or... You can take a few extra minutes. Sure, sure. Cool. Uh, thanks. So just just to clarify, yeah. so you ultimately need to learn this X star, but this seems that this this uh, matrix that you're getting there doesn't use X star anymore. You don't know X star. X star is a true distribution that you got your CIFAR 10 images and labels from. You don't know what that is. Right. You're trying to find one that's hopefully close to it. And that's what you end up doing, for example, this cross entropy minimization. You're trying to minimize the entropy between two densities. One of them is the one you're estimating. Sorry, one of them is the one generated by your iterates. The other one is the empirical approximation to the true. You don't know Z star. You can't do nothing with Z star. Forget about Z star. I just put Z star to say that, that there was some underlying distribution that gave rise to this data. You don't know it. But that's what you've been given. You have to work with them somehow. But it seems like you're not even using this data to generate the. You are the green, right? The green, the green. You're using green to compute the Gauss Newton. But right, but in the natural gradient. The natural gradient. Okay, so you're thinking, because you're thinking of uh, these p's in in classification, for example, they're conditional distributions. So you still use the image, but instead of putting out the label in here, you put the label that you're predicting right now. And that will correspond to sampling from your distribution that, that's coming from X. So that's a conditional condition on data. So if you're still looking at the images in some form. Not the, not for if the classification, not the labels. You only look at the data, fix the data, right? Suppose the, the labels are coming from some random distribution. So it depends on how you model P. But in classification, one thing you can do is that, for example, say the P's are the conditional densities, conditioning on the input, I get some label, distribution on the label, right? So in order to compute that, I don't look at the training label, I look at the label that I'm generating right now. So when do you ever look at the, tra the training label? You only look at the training label, for example, when you're computing the gradient. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yes? In um, cross entropy minimization is very similar to cool back library diagram. Yes, yes. Yes. So my feeling is that the natural gradient yes. creatively approaches to the X star, to the green one. So, okay, let, let me just talk a little bit. Maybe that answers your question, Ali, but uh, I'm going to get to that point right now. <coughs> the last interpretation of this, if you're getting an, a pro completely probabilistic model, doesn't have to be minus a log of a likelihood, could be any loss applied to a, to a, to a uh, density. And remember what we did in the steepest descent. In the steepest descent, says locally, this is a local search method. I'd like to find the uh, the loss function such that locally is at least giving me something decent as long as I restrict myself to some region. Well, this is hard to do. I replace that with the linear approximation. I a result I get it's actually a scaled of the negative gradient, and that's how we get actually steepest descent. 
for the, this is the Kubak Liver Dimensions that Ali was mentioning. Uh, the interpretation of uh, the natural gradient in another way is by saying that um, since the, the KL divergence can be approximated by this Malanobis distance measured by the Fisher information through this argument that you can look later, instead of putting a Euclidean norm at P, I look at the, how the, the, the densities are moving along when I change P, and I like in KL divergence these densities to be bounded. What do I get? Well, it's hard to do. I'm going to linearize that and second order uh, uh, approximation to that. I get that, and the result is actually the Fisher information and the natural gradient that comes. So that's a, another interpretation. All right, I'm not going to talk about the uh, natural uh, the trust region and cubic regularization because uh, Michael alluded to a little bit yesterday. There are some results we can do there and get some complexity. The point of which is that if we do the way we did it in that paper and do the stochastic trust region or stochastic cubic regularization you end up getting rates that are optimal, right? So this epsilon, all those epsilons, none of the methods I showed right now satisfy those approximate optimality. These two do, however. And with these, for example, these many iterations, you satisfy the epsilon approximate second or optimality, right? And these are tight. Okay, so let me go ahead and show a couple of examples uh, in the last five minutes. Um, one is just to show that the, the condition number independence, right? This is a problem with condition number of 10 to the 4. The black is subsample the uh, Newton, the blue is BFGS, and red is uh, accelerated gradient descent and gradient descent. So as you can see, the first order algorithms are doing bad. The blue is okay, the BFGS, and the red subsample Newton method with inexact solve is faster, but, but nothing to write home about. When I increase the condition number, you see that the BFGS is also starting to push upwards because it's not fully second order at the end of the day, it's still looking at the gradient only. The first order methods are pretty much flat out, whereas the Newton algorithms are all starting to go in that as if nothing had happened. And when I turn the condition number, crank it up to 10 to the 10, pretty much everybody else is flattening out, whereas the Newton methods are actually completely insensitive to this issue. And that was, if you remember, I mentioned problem independent convergence. Another thing I want to say, if you implement it correctly, you can actually beat state-of-the-art packages out there. This is an example of where you can actually beat packages such as TensorFlow, um, all the optimization algorithms that's written in there. You can actually beat them in terms of the walk clock time in the scales that you have a one million dimensional parameter space. So that's a... Um, so which one is beating the state-of-the-art? So the, the, the solid is the Newton stop that, that we have done, and the dotted ones are the... The methods already implemented in TensorFlow. So, so these are slower prediction test accuracy. This is a cute actually result. I want to show the, one of the issues Rachel talked about is how we choose step size in second order algorithms. This is the first order algorithm. That's a big, big, big elephant in the room that people say, hey, I run this algorithm, it's working, without saying that I had to wait three to four days to tune the step size before it worked. The second order methods are just much more natural in terms of their step size. Let's, let me see what, let me show you what this graph is saying. This graph is saying that, okay, I have these methods over here, bunch of first order methods and bunch of second order methods and somewhere in between, including a Newt method. And uh, I fix the step size, say, to 10 to the minus 10. I run the algorithms with the fixed step size for 200, say, iterations, and I record the objective value. And I do that for this grid of step sizes, fixed number of iterations, fixed step size, pick the iteration, pick the function value. So as you can see, all of these algorithms, and this U parameter is something that determines how well conditioned the problem is. Here, the problem is very well conditioned. As you can see, everybody can take large steps. They're not going to diverge. They're actually good go down. You can take all of them large steps. If you're too large, then you might diverge. But if you're too small, you're not going to go, you know, you're not progressing much enough. For, but, but, you know, everybody's taking large steps. Let me increase the um, condition number. And look at how these things are separating. Some pattern is emerging. One, one, one of them is staying where they were. And that's a Newton method. That's absolutely, completely independent to this problem conditioning. It continues to take step size of one, no problem at all. Whereas the other ones are being pushed back. In fact, we put a method that we worked on with, with Michael here, and it's actually working <laughs> worse than other ones. So we're not being, you know, trying to trash other ones. It's really, we put ours, we're also, also not good in that sense. That's a, a, an acceleration of Adegrad. 
But as you can see, the Newton method, as if nothing is changing. And uh, some examples in deep learning to show that we can uh, avoid saddle points and so on. And uh, the, the, this was that, is it all rosy? Well, not really, because uh, the problem is that if you're not careful enough, these optimization problems are powerful. You can easily overfit. So here, as you can see, without any regularization, boom, the error goes down, whereas SGD is having a hard time fitting. However, in terms of prediction accuracy, as you can see, SGD doing much better because we actually ended up ended up uh, overfitting. Whereas when you do some batch normalization and these regularization stuff, you can push the, uh, what do you call it, the prediction accuracy high. Still, SGD is winning in this, in this case. It's a work in progress how to regularize, regularize these methods such that they end up being uh, better uh, tools for machine learning. Um, let me now mention a couple of things, my bones I have to pick with the worst case complexity analysis. Like one of the reasons why people don't use second order methods in machine learning is because I had a conversion rate of one over kappa squared. And everyone say, hey, come on, gradient descent is one over kappa, accelerated gradient descent is one over square root kappa. Why should I use one thing, something that has one over kappa squared? Or the BFGS I show it was one over K, well, SGD is also one over K, why should I use the mini batch version of a uh, uh, BFGS. And whenever I hear uh, worst case complexity analysis, whether tight or not, I think about the volumetric flask. And you might wonder what is a volu volumetric flask to do with this. Let's hide that this volumetric flask is the worst case iteration complexity or worst case running time or whatever. Worst case analysis uh, that an algorithm promises. I put in all the algorithms that, all the problems that this algorithm is uh, saying that I can solve. Most of these might end up at the bottom, nowhere near where the prediction, the worst case analysis is saying, only a handful of them will come up where the algorithm running on those actually behave like what is promising in the, uh, in the theory. And this is a picture I have in mind for the Newton type algorithms. The worst case iteration, very bad, but the majority of problems we run almost all the time, they never are near, nowhere near what the, predict, what the complexity analysis is saying. Whereas the first order methods, this is the situation. <laughs> Most of them actually end up being very close to what you predict. And uh, people usually shout, tout this as, as, as a good thing because the theory is matching a practice. But the problem with this is that the, the theory is a worst case analysis. And if you have algorithm that's matching the worst case, that's a bad algorithm. And finally, let me ask you a question. And the answer to this is definitely not, it depends. <laughs> what do Newton's method have in common with air travel? Fast. Both of them are fast, <laughs> but the worst case is very bad. <laughs> <laughs> so if we base our analysis on worst case, none of us would go back home on a plane. We're all going to get on a probably a horse or something. And uh, we don't do it for plane. We shouldn't do that for second order methods either. Thank you. Going back to the slide where you have that loss function and yeah. step sizes, what loss function were you using? Uh, which one? We had a few Did of them. The one that we overfit? Like, no, the one where like the step sizes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a softmax yeah. classification. Softmax. Like just logistic regression. Basically? Softmax, multi-class version of logistic. Like with the neural network or? What? No, no, that was a convex problem. That was a convex problem. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yes. What about the fact that you just can't do second order methods in large scale? I show, well, okay, so I didn't show, I showed actually the, I skipped on a couple of examples. These neural nets examples we have, you pretty much can push it to high enough. In fact, we have something that's even larger than this in the order of millions. The reason is because in particular for neural nets, the people in the automatic differentiation community have, have done a good job convincing everybody that Computing the gradient or the Hessian times a vector is really not much different. Maybe a couple of order, you know, a couple, a couple times more expensive to compute the Hessian times a vector versus the gradient itself. It's almost identical type of backward forward propagation with different input and output. And um, the, the thing is that none of these algorithms require the knowledge of a Hessian. They only require a Hessian times a vector. So the answer is that if you can compute the gradient, you can compute the Hessian times a vector at the same cost. You don't, you 
don't gain from it because the noise level is so high. Noise level in? The stochastic uh, noise. Um, so, okay, so maybe there are... There, I'm just trying to say that, like, it's sometimes, there are situations where it's not worth it. Right now. I'm sure there are uh, too many situations, maybe uh, either or are not worth it. Uh, it's just problem dependent. The, the, the task that we're trying to, to do is that to make them more worth it <laughs> than before. And they could be worth it in the future when we have. Yeah, so let, uh, one thing that. Computing. Absolutely. Yeah. So one thing that I didn't mention was the benefits, advantage of these <laughs> methods. One of the very simple ones is that by definition, these methods have a very expensive peri-duration. Uh, but as a result, they're very effective. So they take far fewer iterations to get to where they want to get. Now suppose you have a distributed system that your data is across the network and the cost is actually the communication. So you can't afford to iterate way too many times because that means I have to send you know, data back and forth. These algorithms are perfect for that setup. right? You just need a handful of iterations, that's it, I'm done, I'll move on. There are things, cases where you have the GPUs and you want to access a lot of data at the time, so those things. So obviously there are many situations where you can argue against one or the other, for sure. Yes? So, so you said that, that it's good to be, have a problem independent complexity. Sure. You also said that it's bad to have your, your, your general performance match your worst case complexity. Yeah. That is to say you have a problem independent complexity. Uh, these seem, that seems like a contradiction. Yeah, so, okay, so, so my point was this. If you, so we have for Newt method, for example, uh, the global convergence is 1 over kappa squared, right? We never see that. If we saw that in practice, that was a bad thing, right? Because it means that this met, this met, these methods are not working. It's actually a good thing. That means that the fault is of, of our style of analysis and not the inherent fault with the algorithm, right? Whereas for first order algorithms, most often what you see is that they're very close to what the pr theory predicts. And we know those are sort of the worst case analysis. They're not the best case or average case or any of that. They're worst case. So that means the average case or even the best case is very close to the worst case. So that means there is a fault, inherent fault, or a hard issue with these algorithms in terms of convergence. Yes? Sorry, just, just just wondering your experience with like running second order methods because for me I've run into a lot of like convergence issues where it doesn't converge at all. Like, does that happen a lot, or how? What do most people do to counter that? I don't know which method you're referring to, but uh... Uh, like a second order methods. Like sometimes I run like interior point methods, or even with neural networks where like the Newton method doesn't do as well as the first order method. Like the objective function doesn't Sure, do sure. So the, yeah. there is one thing, I agree. So there is, there is an issue with the, one thing is the theory and so on and so forth. Another issue is the how we implement these algorithms in practice, right? One thing that you can, for example, say is that, yeah, well, I have a linear system and I do maybe two iterations and I'm done. Maybe that's not such a good idea because at the end of the day, you, you call it a second order, but pretty much what you're doing, you're pretty much doing a first order algorithm because you're not using a lot of the curvature extracting from the Hessian. So implementing these things is not trivial at all. If you look at SGD, well, maybe one reason why machine learning is using it too much is because it's very simple, honestly. It's you just get the gradient, take the negative thing and go. The issue is that you have to fine tune it, uh, the hell out of it, but that's probably easier mentally to work with as opposed to, okay, now how am I going to solve this? How, what's the degree of accuracy and so on, which is going to probably make things in some sense somewhat complicated. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is like, I find that when I run, I'm not sure like what most people do in practice, but when I run second order methods, I feel like I have to tune like even the, the step size or like the, the initial point where I start, like that matters. So I was wondering if that's your experience. That's not what we observed at all in, in, in practice, in the way we do things. It's just you, it's in fact, I had an, I had an uh, example I didn't get to show, but you, you can see it on the slides where we had tough time getting, in fact, we never managed to get uh, SGD with momentum or, or even the Gauss-Newton to go past the saddle point or flat point, whereas the truss region easily, regardless of, regardless of the parameters that we're putting in, is just easily got out of the saddle point. So, you know, I'm not sure what is done in your code that makes things, but I give you that the, the, it, it's not trivial to implement these things, right? Because you have to deal with, with the machinery that if you do it right, you get a good, if you're not, then it might actually hurt yourself. Yes? Regarding your notion of optimality, it seems like you could have a 
uh, not just a matrix with one negative eigenvalue, but a negative definite matrix could satisfy your notion of optimality. Sure. Have you ever encountered this sure. in practice, or have you considered? I don't think we ever saw such a thing, to be honest with you, because we always get a solution by, say, iterating with uh, Hessian times a vector, right? And we never saw that uh, in every iteration of our algorithm, for example, every sub problem solves, every one of these quadratics are negative. You know, we most often it's like after a certain number of iterations, then you hit a negative curvature. So you know, not all of them is is not every direction has to be negative. Sure. Yeah, but in th theory, yeah, it could happen. Yes. So the, the worst case complexity rate that you derive for is a stochastic algorithm based on the expected value. Sure. Uh, or, or high probability, or both. Yeah. I didn't see anything about the variance of the confidence. So if the variance is high, yeah. it can be much worse than the expected. Yeah, so the, t the traditional way of doing these things is with the expectation. More recently, people do high probability, which subsumes all the, all the moments, pretty much. So. But I haven't seen anyone talk about variance, to be honest. Did you mention other uh, sort of average case assumptions where you can do better than one over capital square? Um, for the For the... Are you talking about the... Improving the one over kappa square rate like we... Oh, yeah. Oh, so, so that was what I was going to say that uh, if you look at classical textbooks, if you look at deterministic Newton, this is one over kappa square. Seems like something to do with the way we do analysis and we incorporate this with line search. Now, I was going to bring it up as part of this open problem that there is a clear disconnect between the performance and practice. Maybe the worst case is true. Maybe this mental image of volumetric flask is actually correct, meaning that there are a couple of problems out there that Newton's going to have a hard time getting there. But can we relax this sort of analysis, turn it into an average case analysis, turn it into some sort of thing that there is a, uh, some people that are doing in Lehigh that what they do, they carve out space and they say in this region we get a, we can analyze it better because the region is like the, the function looks better and in this region Yes, we get that. But as long as we are here, we get a good result. Still, it's unsatisfying because you want to have something that's overall is working. And it seems like regardless of where you start, these methods always have behaved similar. So maybe instead of a worst case, uh, should be somewhat of a maybe average case or something like that. You say this is for classical Newton. Classical Newton, correct. The global, the global coverages. The local coverages is quadratic. The global convergence has got this horrible condition number uh, dependence. With line search, I have to emphasize, with line search. Okay, any other questions? Let's thank Fred again.